Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Fish. Before we get going, I just want to let you know we have a very exciting comedian joining us on the show today. So Anna's away for this ep, uh, but in her place, we are joined by the brilliant Olga Koch. Olga is the perfect fish guest. Not only is she incredibly funny, but she's also an absolute thunder dork. She studied computer sciences, she speaks three different languages, she has a very confused and unplaceable accent like I do, and she is absolutely blitzing the comedy scene at the moment. You will have seen her, no doubt, on shows like Live at the Apollo, she's done Pointless Celebrities, and of course, she's been on QI. But the best place, the absolute best place to see Olga is live in person at one of her stand-up shows, and she is currently on tour with her new show, which is called Prawn Cocktail. She's traveling the UK, and then... For any Aussie listeners out there, she's heading down under. So, Aussies, go and see her. She's absolutely brilliant live. And if you want to get a taste of what a full show by Olga is like, she's actually got a few specials up online. So if you go to YouTube, you're going to be able to see her 2022 show, Just Friends. The full show is there. Check it out. And then on Amazon Prime, she has another special called Homecoming. Go to her website generally, rockandrollga.com. It has a list of all the things that she's done from podcasts to other bits and pieces. But for now, here she is on No Such Thing as a Fish. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoburn. My name is Dan Schreiber. I'm sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, James Harkin and Olga Koch. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in a particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Olga. The world's best prom cocktail eater practices his technique with budget meatballs. <laughs> wow. Now, I would say that a prawn is different to a meatball. Different enough that I wouldn't think it was useful for oh, my yeah. training montage. I accept what you've just said, <laughs> and I challenge you to a better replacement to a prawn. Ooh, yeah. A better oh. budget replacement to a prawn. Yeah. Can I give you a better replacement to a prawn? <laughs> Please. Um, there was a guy called Stephen Gates who wrote a book about eating insects, and he said if you don't have any prawns, let's say you don't live near the sea, then uh, Woodlouse is a good replacement. Oh, lovely. And it will taste about the same. And budget, too. I mean, <laughs> Very much budget. all over the garden. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. I don't think I can even picture a Woodlouse. Is that a, like, like a caterpillar? A pill, a pill bug? No. I want, in, no, I, I, I regret having so asked. So in, insect armadillo. So they're the little grey yeah. guys. With the... Okay, so then if yeah. you deshell it, it is still soft on the yeah, inside. Yeah, yeah. Ah. It'd be very fiddly to deshell, oh, wouldn't imagine. it? <laughs> At the <laughs> restaurant. For the number that be... you need as well for yeah. the challenge. No, I think maybe I'm I'm rowing back and saying meatball's fine. As in that yeah. probably is maybe the best. Maybe crab stick? Yeah. I mean, yeah. This guy probably knows what he's. What's it? Do, do we know his name? Is he... Yes, his name is Jeff Esper. Okay, okay. Mm. Uh, also, a very interesting thing about his technique is that he tries to mimic a prawn cocktail as much as he can. So he does eat them cold yeah. and he <laughs> eats them what? tossed in cocktail sauce as opposed oh, yeah. to like marinara or whatever you'd have yeah. um, your meatballs with. There's, yeah. there's this amazing video of him online where you see the practice run where he uses the meatballs. And it's so weird. He's just on his own in his lounge room with a camera running and he's about to eat a Eight minutes worth of like meatball in <laughs> yeah, his face yeah. he says things like so exactly you're gonna use the same sauce he's going 90 percent in the video he's not going 100 <laughs> percent he's giving it 90. Well, you don't oh. want it just for youtube exactly yeah. 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 so he's going 90 and then he says really i should be doing this outside because i think the competition is outside <laughs> and mm -hmm. i need to acclimatize to so uh, in which geographical location is this happening in if it's not the equator or the antarctic <laughs> i don't think he needs to acclimatize well that's the thing so it was too cold uh, for him to do it that day so he didn't but that factors into it i guess it messes with your like capacity to swallow your speed yeah can i explain one more reason why the meatballs were fine as a oh, substitute yeah, yeah. is because the sauce is the most important part of this right. particular competition because it is a seafood sauce but it's really spicy it's supposed to be the spiciest seafood sauce you can get someone who had it said it's like being electrocuted when you eat it and so really he's more about getting through all this spicy sauce than it is about getting through the 
across. Oh, so his we, face yeah. almost melted right at the end of the video. I watched all eight minutes and the final mouthful, he's on the brink of vomiting and you watch for about 30 seconds uh, <laughs> whether or not gonna it's go. going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's really close. Can I give you a few of his records, his Please. other records? Because uh, yeah. Jeff Esper, he's a big, big player in what is known as the MLE, the, the Major League of Eating. Um, <laughs> that's a, it's an official body like you'd have the Baseball <laughs> League or the NBA, the MLE exists. So he's the record holder at certain points. He may have been broken since he set them for spam, eating uh, 9.75 pounds of spam, chicken wings, Fortune Bay Indian tacos, pretzels, pizzas, Jack's donut holes. Donut holes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those are a thing, aren't they? Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking. It's the bit that used to be in the donut. It's not yeah. just the He's empty. eaten them all. That's <laughs> yeah. why they're not there. <laughs> Yeah, and oh, Texas well, sausage. To me, it seems like, you know, in Olympic swimming, how people get loads of medals because you get a medal for 100 meters, for 50 meters, for 200 meters. It's all basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like once you can eat a load of shrimp, then you could probably eat a load of donuts and you could probably eat a load of everything. Oh. It's like he's only got one skill and he's getting all these records. I think it's all to do I, with training, right? Well, I think in Major League Eating, if you are some plucky kid out of nowhere, the best things to go for are things where you can innovate. Because there are some which are volume based. I see. Where you just have to drink as much honey as you can into like whatever. <laughs> and, and that depends on how big your stomach is. Exactly. And right. it just that is just about You slowly. do have to do that competition in just a top no pants poo. <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> <poo -less. laughs> yeah. But if you're um if you're some some like, you know, upstart well, you might be able to develop a new technique. I see. So before we started today, you just had a cheese and what was it? Celery, celery sandwich. Yeah. You might come up with a new way of eating that, like taking the celery out first. Exactly. <laughs> Improving the sandwich by taking out the <laughs> celery. <laughs> I've already had a lot of slacking off about the sandwich. Okay? Um, but you might have a, exactly a new way to eat corn on the cob faster. You could yeah. attach it to like a black and decker so it spins round. So those are the ones where if you're trying to get into this game, and why would you? Uh, that's that's the thing to do. Arriving in New York City on a Greyhound <laughs> bus <laughs> with just a corn in your bag. <laughs> and do you think that you start by going to like breakfast restaurants that have those like breakfast challenges that put you on the yeah. put your photo on the wall, and then there's like a Tom Hanks in Elvis yes. like agent in a corner watching yes. you <laughs> yes. smoking a cigar, thinking you've got promise, kid. I went to a breakfast place the other day that had a breakfast challenge. You had to eat this entire this huge list of like forty sausages, twenty eggs. It wasn't as big as that but it was it looked doable you had 20 minutes to do it and if you managed it you got the meal for free or you had to pay for the whole thing and there's a leaderboard right that had the current champion pete doherty of the libertines no. what? Yeah. yeah yeah what? is that the breakfast that was in the newspapers yes. when he had that big breakfast yeah, yeah. wasn't it yeah exactly so they, no one's beat it since no one's beat it since no wow yeah. i once went to a one of these restaurants for like burgers and stuff and my sister ordered the huge sort of challenge thing. She's quite small, my sister. Mm. And she was really getting through it. And the waiters are all looking at her going, bloody hell, she's doing good. Mm. And I just ordered one hamburger. And it was really small. And I ate it really quickly. And I was like, I'm going to get another hamburger. And then I got my sister to order it. So she's wolfing down uh, all this thing. And she went, can I have another hamburger, please? <laughs> <laughs> I read um, an interview with jo Jeff Esper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> His favorite movie is Cool Hand Luke. Oh, I haven't seen that. Um, well, in it, there's a guy who has to eat 50 eggs in an hour. Right. Uh, and that's, I think, why he likes it. Yeah. To Paul Newman. Paul Newman, yeah. Mm. Well, no, hang oh, on. No. Paul Newman then opened a very successful line of mayonnaise and yes. salad yeah. dressing. Was wasn't that it? to eat with the with the eggs? Well, that's, yeah, was yeah. the film viral marketing for <laughs> Paul Newman Ranch? First ever, oh, yeah. Because the fastest way to eat fifty eggs is actually whip them up on the mayo and mulse them. Oh, right. oh really? Yeah. He doesn't do that in the movie. He just <laughs> noms on them. But in the TV ads, he would. Yeah, he would be yeah. walking, saying, "I like my fifty eggs." <laughs> You know. 50 eggs per bottle, come on, that would be amazing. Uh, anyway, this interview then asked Jeff Esper what a movie of his life would be called, and he said, Cool Hand Jeff. So, nice. that's a good name. You know, he's quite a witty guy as well. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Poor he was Jeff. full. We love you, Jeff. Uh, but then yeah. in 2023, the second and third place in this shrimp eating competition were Miki Sudo and Nick Wary, and they're married to each other. Cool. And did they meet? Oh, did, oh, 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 did they meet doing the Lady and the Tramp? But it's oh. like an 18 foot long sausage and they're yeah. both slowly eating towards each other. I think they met in the competitive eating sphere. That's adorable. It, it, we it, locked eyes as we were both throwing up <laughs> yeah, 100,000 marshmallows into a bucket. <laughs> um, and they said they have a child, the two of them, and they said the child can do anything they want when they grow up except become a competitive eater. Why? 
I think they're just in it and they don't feel like it's a good job to have. It feels like they're worried it's going to be a Darth Vader situation where the child's <laughs> going to knock them off. Yeah. 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 What I will want to say about Mickey Sudo is that she is, I believe, the reigning champion of the Nathan's hot dog eating competition's women's category. Right. And Nathan's, um, the Nathan's Coney Island uh, hot dog eating competition is really the biggest competition in the competitive eating league mm. and the one that put competitive eating on the map. Major League Eating. It was born out of Nathan's. Yeah, really. There you go. Yeah. But it's only been split by gender, I believe, since 2011. Oh. Before oh. that, women used to compete mm. with men together. And they used to place in the top three routinely. Right. And then they split them. And I know all this from a book called Raw Dog by Jamie Loftus. It's an incredible book. I recommend it to everybody. And basically, they were like, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same. But the men's one is uh, televised and the women's isn't. Wow. And women get less prize what? money. Oh, that's, that's actually quite yeah. Sorry, the men's is televised and the women's isn't. Yeah. That surprises me. You or think it would be the other way around? I would think a lot of perverts <laughs> would like nothing more than to see a woman it's eating 75 It's either not televised or televised on like ESPN3 as opposed to ESPN1. Like <laughs> oh, it's something like that. It, it sucks. And I, it is the only competitive eating which is gender split. Sausage eating right. is the only one. All oh, the really? Others, yeah, yeah. All the others are a mixed Oh, mixed I was like, grill. is that an innuendo? You're like, no. You <laughs> no <I can't. laughs> That's up to the audience to make the innuendo there. <laughs> I'm just trying to picture you pitching why it should be back on TV and really, <laughs> I would, really isolating the pervert market here. <laughs> I was uh, pitching, they got big bucks. I would do an incredibly subtle pitch which made it very, very clear <laughs> who's tuning in. Um, Joey Chestnut. Yeah. So he's managed 76 hot dogs in one go. And I think I think we may have even mentioned before the thing to do is to dip the bun in the water so it gets slides all, down. Slides down. But I love this. The 1984 competition. I think this was Nathan's. I'm not sure. It might have been a different league one. It was won by someone. She was a 17 year old West German judo. What do you do? Judo artist? Judoka. Judoka. And she had never had a hot dog before the competition. <gasps> no! Oh, but then that that's incredible? That, and you're like, oh my God, this stuff is incredible. Yeah. I could eat a million. Yeah. yeah. And, she, <laughs> and that was her. Yeah, that's that incredible. That's that, awesome. Was it like she looked at it and she'd never seen one, so she didn't know how to eat it. And she was like, maybe I just shoved 10 of them in my mouth at once. <laughs> she Where did they find a German who's never had a sausage before? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Apparently, uh, Chestnut, uh, Joey Chestnut was saying, once you have that many hot dogs you mm. immediately need the toilet and no. um the problem they don't really digest fully so you kind no, of I don't, no, shit no, hot dogs no, out. No, no, clean no, out no, clean I, out come on. that's what he said how, do you, how can you tell the difference realistically i think when you feel a solid hot dog coming out your butt <laughs> 75 times the bun also comes out that's <laughs> his shit is inside the bun <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a little something about corn. Um, also, I'm uh, basically the Nathan's uh, hot dog eating contest was put on the map in the mid 2000s by a Japanese competitive eater called Takeru Kobayashi. Takeru Tsunami Kabayashi. Ooh, and then ooh. he basically made it super popular in America. And then Joey Chestnut was introduced to him as like the American down home alternative. Ooh. And so it was, again, it's the, the Nathan's hot dog eating competition is a story of sexism and racism. And hot dogs. Oh. <laughs> In the advertising, they mostly stress the hot dog part of it, don't they? Fine print, fine print. If only we could get perverts into that fantastic <laughs> strap line. Oh, dear. Do you know what chipmunking is? You might have seen this in your... So in I would journey. think oh, it's like... Okay. Going, oh, um, yes. you know what? I hadn't thought about it. And then Dan just did a, an I action. I did an action. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's storing in your That's cheeks. That's it. <gasps> That's it. Now... Were you going to say it was like getting naked and dancing? I just think it's speaking in a very high pitched voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as, as you might expect, given what we're talking about, it's absolutely dancing. It's, um, the press conferences would be great, though, in the lead up to that. <laughs> You're going down! <laughs> no, it has to be in your mouth, right? The food before the count ends, right? So if you're counting down, you know, you've got 10 minutes to eat this many whatevers. The food has to be in your mouth and then you get 30 seconds to swallow it. Yeah. So often the photo finish bit is just, right, oh. just get all of this in your mouth. Yeah, and yeah. as long as you get you get 30 seconds after the clock stops. That's there used it. to be, all you had to do was swallow it in a timely manner. That's all it said. <laughs> right. And it didn't say it was exactly 30 seconds. And then there was a guy called Crazy Legs Conti uh, who lost a competition because he couldn't eat it in a timely manner. And they thought we're going to have to make a proper time. I think that's now. right. It's like I've started so I'll finish or the so. bell, yeah. the quiz bell goes. Would this make sense of the final few seconds of Jeff Esper's practice for the prawn cocktail? Because he goes over eight minutes. He stops the clock and he has a mouth that is yep. absolutely and i'm going to spit it out and he's 
So that's what it is. He's monkey. using his 30 seconds. He's chipmunking. Yeah. Clever. Um, Very clever. Crazy Legs, just oh, yeah. while you mentioned him, James, he, I read an article, it's his legal name, Crazy Legs Conti. <laughs> he compares, I'm quoting here from the article, compares professional eaters to musicians. He says the way eaters move and shake is an effort to get breath out of the esophagus, stomach, and lower intestine, oh. as trumpeters would with their instrument. Mm. That's interesting. You know, circular breathing, where mm. you can play like a didgeridoo without breathing because yeah. you breathe through your nose and out of your mouth. Yeah. Do you reckon they try that? That could be a new innovation. Yeah. Is the breath sausage in this? <laughs> well, I mean, you shove as much sausage in your mouth while breathing through your nose. Through your is nose. What I would oh, say. maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. But like, maybe the sausage in the nose is the Fosbury flop moment <laughs> that, that no hero has managed to achieve. Yet. Oh, right. You found two more entry points. Yeah. Right. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the perverts. Are... <laughs> They're tuning in. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to let you know we are sponsored this week by LinkedIn Jobs. That is right. So if you're someone who's looking for candidates, for instance, if you have a small business, you want to find really great professional employees that perfectly suit your role, you have to find them on LinkedIn Jobs because it has a network of more than a billion professionals on it. That is more than a seventh of the world's population. It's the best place to find the right person for your company. It really is. It gives you access to professionals that you can't find anywhere else. You could, sure, go out into the street and shout your requirements. But if you're hiring quite specific people for your small business and you need to get the right person, LinkedIn Jobs is probably the better way to go. In fact, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. That really does make hiring quite easy. That's right. So ditch the town crier <laughs> approach and post your job for free at linkedin.com slash fish. So if you go to linkedin.com slash fish, you can post your job for free. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash fish. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. On with the show. On with the podcast. Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is... James. Okay, my fact this week is in the Archie language of southern Russia, a single verb can have 1,502,839 possible forms. Is so, that normal <laughs> for most languages? Or? It is not normal. How I would say. <laughs> What's a close forms? second? So if you think, think that in English, like to podcast, right? Yeah. So you podcast, she podcasts, yeah. I was podcasting, I podcasted. And there's not much else because they're all I just... I would have been podcasting. Yeah, I guess. But then that's, that's kind tenses, of the same ending. Right. No, yeah. this is tenses as well. Okay, okay. So in Russian, obviously, you would have I, you, she, they, all that kind of stuff. But also you have the past tense, which would be different for masculine and feminine. You would have the future tense. You have gerunds. You have participles. You have all sorts of stuff in Russian. But it's manageable because I've studied it. It is manageable. But in Archie, it just goes crazy. You have, as well as masculine <laughs> and feminine, you have different terms for domestic animals, for wild animals, for <laughs> young animals, old animals. So if you say the pig podcasted, yeah, you would need yeah. to know if it was a wild pig or a domestic pig oh to God. know how Which to say Which is always my number one question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a different, if it's um, insects, it's a different ending. If it's wow. mythical beings, musical instruments serials, abstract concepts, they all have different endings. Everybody's got a podcast these days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How does anyone um, learn it or get anything done? Yeah. I think I you just most of it you just naturally pick up these kind of things if you if you live in it. But also Yeah, because before you get to that word, you'd have to stop and investigate. All right, wild or, yeah, or domesticated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alive or dead. But also like um the number of things. So if it's one thing or two things right. or many things, it's different. Like Imagine similar in Russian. Solving a crime based on a phone call because you know that the verb was referring to a thing and you could yes. investigate what that thing was. That's good. We know that they have a They're... wild insect. <laughs> 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 who has a podcast oh, that's nice um, and also it's different um, depending on how you know it's being done so if you know it's happened it's different if you're speculating it's happened it's different if you're admiring something that's happening it's different if something's forbidden it's different and you can mix and match all of these different things to get to so 1.5 like, million I admired the forbidden tame young locust <laughs> podcast 
<laughs> or but, podcasting. But whatever. you think about that. You had to use so many words to say that, right? Yeah. But they would be able to say it in one word yeah, that's really because efficient. they would know all of the endings. They'd be like, well, that's implied by the way you've oh. said so it. So locust stays the same, like all of that stuff. You could just say the locust podcasted. So you just right. a verb and a noun and you would get all of that information by all the different endings. It's and like uh, anti-German. Yeah. It's the most efficient. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so super as a result, has this language become hugely popular and spoken by tens of millions? <laughs> it's it's so spoken by very, very few people. People <laughs> in Dagestan in Russia, and it's about 20 kilometers away from the village of Sovkra Adnaya. Who do you remember? It was the place where everyone knows how to tightrope. Oh, no way. Yeah, there's a village in Russia where everyone knows how to tightrope, and it's just over the mountain from there. What an amazing pocket of the planet <laughs> this is. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> this is incredible. And I should also say that, Andy, once you've learned all of these one million different forms yeah. of, of standard verbs, that helps you with about 170 of the most common verbs, but there are more than a thousand exceptions, <laughs> which right. you then have to learn on top of that. <laughs> oh, and the language can be written in Latin script or in Cyrillic. And in either way, the language has got 74 letters. So you need to learn 148 letters. What I was going to, to ask, how many letters can there be for there to be this many endings? Because you would just run out of letters for even combination. Yeah, this is 74. why I failed my Archie GCSE oral. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> That's why. Oh, that's so annoyed. <laughs> so yeah, it's just a very, very complicated language. And it exists. Have you heard of the Foreign Service Institute? I think they're an American outfit. No. And basically they sort of rate languages on how hard they are to learn. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, like, for English speakers, sorry, okay. native English speakers. So, like, French is category one. You know, for, like, romance languages, because they're... Like English borrows a lot. We from derive them. a lot. Yeah, yeah. And you so, already know. But that's half of Engl- yeah. easy for English people. Completely. To learn, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then category three is Indian, uh, various Indian languages and Swahili. Category four, it takes forty-four weeks to learn. It's sort of going up in the number of weeks. Yeah. So Russian, Hindi, Tamil. How many these. weeks is it supposed to have taken me to learn Russian? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry. You're done. Well, it's taken me five years, and I'm intermediate. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, category five is Mandarin, Cantonese, hey, ja- Japanese, Korean, Arabic. Category two only contains German. It's oh. completely Wait, but English is a Germanic you... language. I know. What? I think I think they decided it's a bit harder than French, but it's the only one. It's just there on its own in their category. Actually, system. German does have quite a lot of conjugation, doesn't it? Because you speak German a little bit. It's got four basic cases, and yeah. then like it's not. It's all right. It's a bit. It's a bit because like French and Spanish and um, Italian, they're all kind of debased Latin, if you yeah. like, because they just cut out all the complicated endings and right. you know and it's because as latin spread i want yeah i guess yeah. it's like they're like how to speak it correctly because i speak yeah. fluent german but i yeah. can't conjugate shit i'm just i'm all i'm always like you know what i'm saying but, but do you get I it right do like, you get it right uh, even though ish. you like okay. sometimes i'll be like i'll know a noun but i won't remember its article so i'll like gender it just on a guess alone and i'm sure that so i'm I, sure whoever i'm speaking to will kind of guess but i always get worried about that because if i get the gender of a noun wrong they like they won't know i'm if i'm say das table or whatever i know it's not table i can't remember the word table either but like i think <laughs> people and you're just tish. like das tisch eh? das tisch der tisch it's not doesn't change the, the yeah. fact that it's a tish so it's fun <laughs> relax it fun? Oh, it is. <laughs> because i i read an article um, where they interviewed 56 native french speakers and they asked them to assign the gender of 93 masculine words, and they agreed on only 17 of them. <laughs> and they were asked to assign the gender of 50 feminine words, and they agreed on only one. Wow. It's so just vibes. It just... <laughs> I love that. This is You fixed German, basically, for anyone struggling. <laughs> I think that's a good thing in all languages, really, is that if you just try people mm. will accept it. Yeah, like, that's true. Yeah, not... the Russian language has th- three three genders for any noun, but if you get it wrong, I'll still know what you're talking about. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, mm. maybe I'm making a lot of German and Russian people really angry. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Archie on the list? Archie is not on this list. <laughs> I think there's a secret it's category. Too far in a lot yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Russian is difficult because the stress can matter, right, in words. And that can make a big difference. So you can see it written down and you wouldn't know necessarily the difference between, say, muka and muka. Right. Where right, one right, of them right. means flower yeah. and the other one means torture. Yeah. Oh. So if you just see that written down and they don't have the well, stress. Well, if you have on... celiac. <laughs> yeah. oh, that, Sorry, kind, that kind of flower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was yeah. thinking so... the other kind of flower. <laughs> Again? Oh my God. Sorry. Oh, flower, flower. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think, is there any way of telling verbally flower? No, flower. context only, I think. Flower. We don't Maybe Irish flower. accent? I always say floor. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. People mistake it for the <laughs> thing we want. Valentine's Day is always very disappointing, though, for your wife, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lovely flaw. <laughs> there was a woman. Oh, I wish I could remember this now. Oh, God. There was a woman in America who was arrested for throwing a pancake at an American president. And I can't remember which president it was, but when she was arrested, they asked her about it. And she said she couldn't find any flowers, but this contained flour. And she thought it would be just the same. What? Was it re was this sort of no, last 50 like years? Hundreds of years okay, ago. Okay. hundred years ago. Easy. Do you remember yeah. when I made a karate magazine news article for spitting on someone? And that was a misunderstanding of word what? as well. Yeah. No? I don't remember this. This is in Hong Kong. I was in Karate Monthly. Uh, I think that was a news story rather than As like one of those little... That's where I know you from. <laughs> <laughs> what? Is this real? Yeah, I was, I was, um, I was studying uh, Kempo at the time, which is a form of martial art. And I was sparring with a kid. And my the guy who's training me, he used to call me Danny. And he had a bit of a lisp. And he was yelling, spin on him, Danny, spin on him, <sighs> to spin kick him. But I heard, spin on him, Danny. And I literally just went, <laughs> and spat on his face. No. Yeah, and they paused the fight. And they were like, what was that? <laughs> said, Is this was, true? Yeah, yeah. And How it, old were you? <laughs> <laughs> 10, 11. <laughs> I can't believe, like, honestly, Dan, I've known you for 20 years. And every week, it's amazing, some of the isn't insane it? thing yeah. comes out. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was in Hong Kong and it was... You were in a karate-based newspaper. Uh, in Magazine, yeah. Sorry, mag okay. I guess it's one of those, like, the funny stories kind of bit of yeah, it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. yeah it wasn't, funny. like, international karate news. It wasn't headline. No, I like, uh, yeah. What's, um, the, what's the easiest word on the planet? The easiest word? Yeah. The, so the, is it um, the most universal? Mama. The most universal. Not bad, hey. but I think hey. ne oh, nearly closer, Olga. Huh? Bingo. Oh. I knew it. Sorry, oh. I knew it. <laughs> she speaks three languages. Of course she knew it. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be incredible if you would just, you genuinely hadn't heard the question because you weren't listening. <laughs> and you, and you know, so yeah, we anyway. can edit, edit, fix it in post. Yeah. It's, huh? Yeah. Huh? Every language has a version for, can you please quickly clarify? And in every language it's, huh? Because it would be very annoying if you had to say a sentence to say, can you quickly clarify? So that's it. And it means that... You know, it can de-escalate tension between you and someone else, even if you don't speak the same language. Uh -huh. But also, does that also mean that the inflection of a question is the same in every language? No oh. idea. Because it's not really How a sound much, it's much more, it's literally, to, it's, in my mind, it's just the sound of a question mark. I think actually that's not true because uh -huh. some languages have question words, don't they? Like English and Russian do, like who, what, when, all that kind of mm. stuff. But some languages... It depends on the inflection about whether yes, it's a it question does. or not a question. Yeah. But English has that a bit too, doesn't it? You could say, I live here. And that's a question. Yeah. So, yeah. Whereas, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's an Aussie inflection as well. That's true. I yeah. live here in Australia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we had that thing, David Crystal, the linguist, said that the Aussie inflection at the end was a useful thing because it was both a, I understand the statement, but I also am asking you, it's up to you. You don't need to pick it up as a question, but it works as a question. You, you can, can if you like. Yeah, with that the inflection. That feels like a mind game you'd play in like a corporate interview. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, you got the job? <laughs> <laughs> Just as they're walking out of the door. <laughs> we find him guilty? <laughs> Um, I need to I need to to get something off my chest. So yeah. the closest so far so far I've ever been to getting cancelled uh, is uh, uh, thanks to a joke that I wrote about uh, the word empathy in Russian. And so the the setup of the joke is the Russian language doesn't have the word for empathy. Can you imagine what that feels like? I couldn't. Um, <laughs> and so yeah. I posted this joke online, and the avalanche of Russian people <laughs> going to correct me to say that there is actually a word <laughs> in Russian for empathy and you're actually stupid and dumb and not a patriot. But, <laughs> but um, I would say 90% of the corrections were uh, the word for sympathy, obviously, um, that is very easily checked through Google Translate. So basically the word that they keep uh, suggesting is sympathy, which is sympatia, uh, which is close to empathy, but not mm. quite. Then they'd say sastradanya, which is compassion, which again is close, but not quite. <laughs> and then very rarely they will say empatia, which is essentially the same sort of like, I guess, Greek root for it, empathy, mm. empatia, which is a word that has not been widely used in Russia up until I want to say two years ago. And I know mm. this because there's loads of articles in Russia that are essentially titled, what is this word empatia? And <laughs> What does it mean? And so the joke, the setup of the joke, I feel like I'm I'm in court right now. The setup of the joke is that and I why do you think this is funny? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. even know where I'm going with this, but I just think that it's really funny because they, they think that I'm sort of 
trying to smite the Russian people or say that Russians don't understand what empathy is. And mm. surely that's something that you can explain in more than just one word. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, to sort of, I guess, make right with the Russians, I'll I'll share a Russian word that we have that you don't in English. Oh, right? okay, yeah. And that's listapat, which is uh, the word for falling leaves. So it's like rainfall, we have leaf fall. Oh, oh, nice. oh that's And good. you don't. Say the word again. Because you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we can actually have some feelings about it when we see it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're speaking to a Russian, you can tell whether they're a virologist or not by the way they talk. Mm. Uh, and that is because <laughs> in Russian you have animate and inanimate nouns, right? The endings can change up whether something's alive. And so virus, virus in Russian, is most people would say it's inanimate, but virologists always think it's alive, a virus. Because virus, is it alive? Is it not alive? Actually, nobody really knows. But virologists right. think it's alive and normal people tend to not say it's alive. So if you say... Um, on dal manier coronavirus, mm. then that would mean he gave me coronavirus, but that would be a person who's not a virologist <laughs> saying it. But if you said on dal manier coronavirusa, that would be animate and it would be a virologist saying it because they think I viruses see. are alive. And how <laughs> useful have you found this change in your life? <laughs> Again, I think that this, you could use that to solve a crime. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah Who was yeah, the murderer? Yeah. It was It was. It was a virologist. virologist yeah. In the library with a candlestick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably with the anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to know a fun fact? Yeah. So you know how like... Not on this show. <laughs> You've come to the wrong place, lady. <laughs> so do you know how like... French kiss is making out. Oh, yeah. Or like Irish goodbye is leaving without saying yeah. uh, goodbye. Uh, yeah. Or French exit as well. Yeah. But um, in Russian, a buffet is a Swedish table. Uh, and a family of three, which is like two women and a man or whatever whatever combination of genders in a, uh, in a throuplet, is a Swedish family. Get away. Uh, yeah. So menage a trois, which is what we would call it. I don't know. Because like uh, three people living together. It's not a threesome. Wow. It is like, yeah. it's a, it is a I relationship see. of three. A throuple. A throuple. I'm the only one still saying menage a trois. <laughs> um, everyone else said throuple. I'm, I'm out there on the apps. <laughs> on the pervert apps. <laughs> <laughs> menage a deux seeks. <laughs> Loves. ESPN. Nostril based. <laughs> 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 in competitions. <laughs> uh, either this is for Olga and James. Pee hole dandruff. Is that a? Don't speak. I'm not <laughs> a native Russian speaker. But you love dirty words. So, uh, that's true. Yeah, what I've is, never heard. Of pee -hole I just dandruff. I went on I went on a site where it was sort of like weird, rude words from Russia. And and can you say it in Russian? This, this bottom. What? Have you ever heard of that word before? I have never seen this in my life. I didn't move from Russian when I was 14, so maybe like it's a sort of high school word. That's a yeah, 15, sure. That word is a 15 certificate, so you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't have known about it. See, I don't think it's a real word, but it was on a site. What does it, what does it mean? Yeah. Sorry. It kind of doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's just, a, you're just it's a beautiful bloody... word for when the <laughs> pollen falls from the trees. <laughs> I can't believe we don't have or this just word in English. Amber <laughs> Do you know the Bicol language of the Philippines doesn't have, um, it has swear words, but people don't really use them because it has a complete other vocabulary if you're angry. So oh. you speak normal Bicol, blah, 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 blah. But as soon as you're angry, you just change all the words that you use so that people can tell you're angry. Oh, that's great. I think so you're saying good. the same stuff, but... It's different using different words using for it. Using different words, yeah. So it's a bit like with my daughter <laughs> when she does something bad. I normally call her Jelly, but if she does something bad, I go, Angel! Like, yeah. Just, yeah. You know, it's an angry... But it's a completely different vocabulary, even. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I good. hate to bring it up, but again, such beautiful evidence in a court case. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like, was it a crime of passion? I don't know! <laughs> yeah, that's so good. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three. That is Andy. My fact is, if cars had improved at the same rate as computers since 1971, they would now be able to travel at nearly the speed of light. Wouldn't that be cool? And if my grandmother had wheels, <laughs> yes. she would also be traveling at the speed of light. They would also be smaller. The cars, right? Yes, they would be about half an inch long, unfortunately. <laughs> so, ah. And this is based on something that Gordon Moore who was the co-founder of Intel, mm -hmm. huge computer company, said in 1965. He noticed that the number of transistors you can fit on a, a chip, a computer chip, had been roughly doubling every year for the previous 10 years. And he said, this is amazing. 
and he thought it would keep going. He thought the principle would apply. Maybe it would be every two years the number you could fit on a jet doubled. But he said, I think it's good for at least 10 more years. And it actually has stayed true for about 50 years at least since he wrote that. And it's slowing down a bit now, but cars would be able to travel at the speed of light because the number of transistors mm. you can fit on a computer chip now is so huge. Mm. The numbers are just mind-boggling of how much things have improved. I suppose the thing was that we got to a speed with cars where we thought there's no point going much faster. Is that right? Because of safety reasons and stuff like that? I suppose Obviously, so, if we yeah. moved at the speed of light, then we'd also go infinite mass. And Oh, that would slow you down. You don't, no, it wouldn't slow what, you down. Well, you'd, 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 yes, it well, would. You'd break yeah. through the car door. You'd, it'd be, <laughs> well, no, because I, I saw an interview with Lewis Hamilton the other day, and he was talking about how when you're driving a Formula One car, yeah. everything about your the structure of your body needs to be as strong as possible. Because when you take a turn at 180 miles an hour, mm. yeah. your body does not go with the car. They have strong necks, don't they? Yeah. But uh -huh. yeah, I mean, like, there's no point getting faster than, you know, you get cars that can go 200 miles an hour or, or faster, but there's no point having them because you can't go faster than no them. you're right spaceships are useful though yeah yes. again it's just it's really just about transistors i i, I feel <laughs> like i've completely but am i correct in understanding that like i remember this distinctly as an example in a textbook that at some point it becomes imperceptible to humans so like they tried doubling the amount of pixels in uh, like computer graphics but at some point oh, once you double it a uh, human eye can't see that it's double that's I'm a really sure good that's point true yeah i think a computer screen now can show more colors than the human eye can perceive yeah so who's like that a really for? good one yeah right. if you were traveling at near speed of light yeah. this is kind of a physics question yeah. really um and you had to take a left right yeah you're in space <laughs> if you needed an exit sign but i'm traveling at close to the speed of light yeah how would you how would you do that as in you won't be able to see it yeah at mm. what point how big and how <laughs> far away would it have to be <laughs> that's a really good point uh Leave it with me. Oh, I'll, write right. <laughs> I'll write to Randall Monroe. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He is way more qualified than me to do that. All right. You want to hear something about transistors? Sh sure. This is no genuinely. Yeah. They're, um, they're unbelievably interesting. Transistors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, the the light would still come to oh, you. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Andy. Because you're no, going no, no, in the no. opposite direction to the sign, right? So yeah. you're going towards the going sign. Going towards the sign. So the light will still get to you just as quickly. Ah. So just as fine. Fa faster, if anything. No. Well, to the point where you're at at any moment, it would just get you at the same speed. I think it still needs to be a big sign from that distance. Yeah. Saying yes. left here. I oh, think yeah. it's always got to be a big sign in space. It's always got to be a big sign in space. Happy with that, Dan? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was great. Back to your transistors. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just, like, here's the thing. Right, 1971, Intel released their first ever microprocessor, right? So it's, I do no, have a absolutely not. No, no, no. no. <laughs> The chip was 12 square millimeters, right? Picture that. 12 square millimeters. Okay, really not so very big at all. Three millimeters times four millimeters. Right. They had 2,300 transistors fitted wow. onto that space. It's pretty good, right? Um, the gap between each transistor was 10,000 nanometers, which is the size of a red blood cell. Just to give you an idea of what. Mm -hmm. the, okay. Yep. Today, the most advanced chips can fit into that space, not 2,300 transistors, but 130 million. <laughs> what does that mean? Just, what does it mean? It, it, it can't, it's insane. The gap is 14 nanometers between them. Very, very, very small. I think the Jesus. the transistors are so they're so tiny, they're so sort of impossibly small. Basically, in the transistors, we should say they're like the taps. As in, like, they're either on or they're off. Yes. They make up the ones and zeros. They're little switches which change their state depending on whether an electric current is flowing mm. through them or not. And your phone has millions of them in it. Your phone will have so many millions. And it's quite, it's, it's obviously really hard to get your head around because the numbers are just so mind-boggling. Like, in 2015, I mean, nearly a decade ago, the world created 13 trillion transistors every second. Wow. What? We're it's more, just... tra this is basically a transistor <laughs> planet now, isn't it? Like, There's pretty so much. many of them. Yeah. And they're now kind of printed directly onto the chips. It's not like there's a big pile of... Yeah, someone shot. Like a jeweler trying no, for exactly. oh, I've dropped. I've dropped it. Nobody, nobody yeah. move. Nobody move. <laughs> just one old man in a cave in Turkey who's just putting each one together. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it's just mind blowing, and this stuff is what the entire world is made of. All the everything yeah. you're listening to this podcast through yeah. is tr is transistor based. It's Crazy. all based on this stuff, and it's it's so far beyond most people's comprehension yeah. unless you spend years on it you know it's insane no, but i guess it's just so big aren't they it's just hard to really get your head around any of the numbers yeah like for instance the new google computer the quantum one that they're supposed to have made and no one's mm. sure if they've made it or not 
if they have then that's could... so funny for a quantum computer <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh, yeah. it exists and it doesn't exist at the same time yeah it can do as many calculations in two seconds as if you got the entire population of india to do a sum every second since the beginning of the universe <laughs> wow. that would be the same as this computer can do in two seconds Jeez. and again that's it's so hard to understand. It's amazing. <laughs> wow. And, that, and the reason the transistors have been getting so much smaller is partly is a really good thing, partly because when they get smaller, you get less uh, electricity wasted and less mm. heat wastage. Obviously, yeah. the process generates a lot of uh, heat. So actually, making them smaller means you save huge amounts of energy, which is part of the reason they yeah. can do it and that it's a good thing. Because I think Moore said at the very start, he said one of the problems is going to be we're going to get more and more transistors, but everything's just going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Yes. And if you've got a million transistors in your phone, you just won't be able to pick it up. It'll just set fire to the table as soon as you put it on the table. Wow. Exactly. But then they found out ways to counteract that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now they are so small. That I find, Again, this is mad that quantum effects are starting to come into play and the gates... Are, are no longer functioning properly because they're so small that you get some electrons leaking through even when it's supposed to be off because they're now down to kind of electron size, right, okay. the barrier. and the So they're having to work out new shapes of transistor to re-exert some control over this gate because it, it's too wow. leaky for individual electrons. I I've mean, got a question for Dan. Oh. Oh, yeah. You're traveling on an electron. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a neutron on your left-hand side. Yeah. How big would the sign have to be? In order for you to see. For me to... Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I did have a, an additional question I wanted to ask earlier, which is how, if you saw the sign saying take a left, you're traveling near to the speed of light, yeah. you're going to have to slow down. How far away does the sign need to be for you to de-accelerate? Decelerate. Decelerate. <laughs> where you go slow enough that you can take a left. I mean, it depends how fast you're going. Because you said mm. close to the speed of light. Is it 99% the speed of light? Yeah, is it 98%? Is it 97%? Yeah. Mm. That's a classic follow-up question of a person who does not know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've just suddenly remembered this is to do with cars, but also to do with transistors. And yeah. I remember that there was a guy, the co-creator of the transistor, won a Nobel Prize for it. I'm okay. going off the top of my head yeah, here. Yeah. But he's one of the only few people to win two Nobel Prizes, right? Oh. So the second time that he got announced as the Nobel Prize winner, there was a party that was going to, because, you know, they kind of know that something's yeah, coming yeah. up, was being thrown for him. And he almost didn't make it to the party because he couldn't open his electric garage because the transistor had broken <gasps> that allowed for it to switch open. Lovely. And so someone had to come and pick him up <laughs> oh, and take him to the party. So nice. so, um, Moore, Gordon Moore, he was a very cool guy, very interesting guy, co-founded Intel. Yeah. Um, he, I mean, gave... He became incredibly rich, obviously, and gave loads and loads of his money away to protect the Amazon, protecting salmon rivers, because he's a very keen fisherman. Uh, but he founded uh, Intel with Robert Noyce, was his colleague. Noyce! And they wanted to call their <laughs> they firm... They invented Brooklyn Nine-Nine, didn't they? <laughs> they wanted to call the company More Noyce. More uh -huh. This is more noise uh -huh. than anything else. And they, sadly, they thought it wouldn't be right for an electronics company. It wouldn't be appropriate or something. Really? So they called it noise in computers. In well, noise I know. Computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Weird. But I also love that his sort of contribution to managing is just coming to his team every year and saying, double it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. Well, yeah, because actually, quite a lot of it with Moore's Law became like a self fulfilling prophecy. They knew that it was going to have to double in a year or in two years. And so that's what they did. They could have gone faster, but they were like, oh, no, it has to do this. Right. It's still holding up, I think. It depends it, who you speak to. People have been predicting that it's going to... We can't possibly keep on doubling it every two... And maybe it's now close to every three or something, but it's... it's. Uh, well, have it's, you heard of Bremerman's Limit? No. Bremerman's Limit. So there was a guy <laughs> called Hans Bremerman. Um, and he said that there was a limit on the maximum rate of computation that could be achieved in a self-contained system in the material universe. So we would get to a limit of how much I see. could be. And he used, uh, okay. I don't understand the mathematics of it, but he uses Einstein's equations in order to make sense of it. Um, so Bremerman, who was born in Bremen in Germany. <laughs> no. Yeah, really? to Bernard Bremen and, <laughs> no. and Berta Bremen. And, like, <laughs> yeah. Really? So cool. Uh, do you know what the fastest supercomputer in England is called? In England? Oh, oh so... Is it, it a classic English uh, name, like Nigel? It's, or... Yeah, it is. I think less uh, patriarchal. Ha Betty! Betty, Ooh, nice. Betty is the nice. 457th most powerful computer in the world. <laughs> Have you got a list that goes up to 457? <laughs> it goes up to 500. I'll say Elizabeth. 
No. Um, oh, okay. I mean, it's almost impossible to guess. I know. Okay, well... Um, but it's a woman's name. It's a woman's name. Oh, it's a woman's name. It's okay. quite an old-fashioned woman's name. Apologies to any of the people with this name. Oh, um, Margaret. Dor Aggie. Maud. <laughs> Agatha. Dotty. Dotty. No, it's Dawn. 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 Dawn is the fastest supercomputer in England. Uh, and other supercomputers, uh, Robert is the 103rd, <laughs> Alex is the 187th, Jean is the 288th, and Henry is the 293rd. Hmm. Some, Some of the most uninspiring names. It feels that way, well, doesn't it? Dawn is really good because you can say the dawn of a new yeah, age, yeah, whereas yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. say this is the Robert of a new age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when do supercomputers stop being super? Hmm. Like surely supercomputers from 20 years ago are no longer oh, super. Oh yeah, or... great point. It's all the number of calculations per second, isn't it? Yeah. Or the number of and surely yeah. the bar second. keeps rising, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had using old computers a very big problem a couple of years ago, four years ago. So while the pandemic was breaking out, one thing that went a bit unnoticed is that hundreds of places got hit by the millennium bug Y2K. What? In 2020? In 2020, yeah. Why? Because what happened was at the time, so Y2K was a big problem, right? The problem was is that when we hit 2000, the computers thought it was 1900. That was yeah, the, yeah. So it was jumping backwards and that was so going to cause chaos. So you would go 1997, 1998, 1999, 1900. Yeah. Exactly. And that was going to mess up loads And that was going to mess up everything. Yeah. That's the best setup for a rom-com I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> a singleton in 1999 at a New Year's party travels back in time and falls in love with someone from 1900. Oh, yeah. Guys! That's That's very nice. With yeah. a computer that glitches yeah. and gets them. Yes. Um, but yeah, so what ended up happening was in that period where everyone was desperately trying to fix a Y2K bug, they changed the coding so that it was 2020. And they thought oh. what would happen is, so 2O became the number, right? And they thought in the 20 years subsequent, they're going to become obsolete. We'll have new computers. This is not going to be an issue. I see. So computers thought it was 2020, but actually it was 2000. Is that right? Oh. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, so then we got to 2020 and everyone went, <laughs> like Brexit, we've been kicking it down the road. <laughs> we kicked it down the road. Now, a lot of places had changed their systems, but a bunch hadn't. So huh. there was, and it was weird things, like there was a version of a game of WWF, which crashed because it was an online download. Oh and my so they had God, to <laughs> what did we do? Because <laughs> I thought like planes were going to fall from the sky and stuff. Not people won't be able to play WWF on the PlayStation. And we now problem. work out how Dan knows about this problem. <laughs> His, his plans like, for lockdown were completely wrecked. This is a huge issue. We could download WWF. Also other things, I imagine. Uh, oh, yeah, and 5,000 players fell out of the sky. Yeah. No, um, and it was like things like um, grocery stores that had till systems that were automated. Right, Suddenly right. those were crashing. So you couldn't by. buy the game in the first place. <laughs> exactly. It was what a nightmare. nightmare. Yeah. It was horrible. There was a website called Splunk, uh, which suffered from it. And, oh, um, not Splunk! <laughs> <laughs> Splunk is a website that looks for errors in computing. How so did that you was accidentally a... end up on that website? Can <laughs> I tell you one more thing? Yeah. Okay, this is about how your phone CPU is made. It's sort of, what is that, central processing unit? This is yes. A... Okay. okay, this is from an interview with a guy called Chris Miller, who's written a book called Chip War. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm quoting him directly. This is what gets into your modern phones, right? A ball of tin falls at a rate of several hundred miles an hour through a vacuum... It's only about 30 millionths of a meter across. Okay, Small ball of tin. Hmm. It is pulverized by two shots from one of the most powerful lasers ever deployed and explodes into a plasma measuring several times hotter than the surface of the sun. This plasma emits extreme ultraviolet light at exactly the right wavelength of 13 and a half nanometers, which is then collected via a dozen mirrors, which are themselves the flattest mirrors humans have ever produced. Hmm. The mirrors reflect the light at just the right angle so it hits the silicon wafer and carves the circuits onto the chips that make your iPhone possible. What? And uh, that's so that Dan can play WWF games on his phone. It's the biggest step down for this system. It's, like, that's, isn't that nuts? That's how. That's I don't how think I understood any of that. I'll be honest. I'm clinging on. I mean, it's incredible. Oh, uh, we should say uh, Kenny Stoltz, a listener, sent that in a little while ago, that interview with Chris Miller. It's just, that is nuts, isn't it? And these machines, they're so accurate that it's like shooting a laser from the moon and hitting an individual coin on Earth. <gasps> That's Apple, how precise Apple they can deserve wow. every penny they get, don't they? <laughs> Especially the podcasting team. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that on the same day that Joni Mitchell released the Greatest Hits album, she also released a Greatest Misses album. 
Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. I know. Yeah. Um, what is it? Is it terrible? Like, is it absolutely no, no, awful, it... bad songs? <laughs> yeah, it's, A Case it's... of You is on it. What's that? So L- good, most popular songs. Okay. Yeah. So, but I mean, it's a collection from other albums, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. So it's so, her right? favorite ones that weren't commercially successful. Exactly. Like, that's right. See. Okay. And she was so happy with it, she tried to release Mrs. Two, uh, but the, <laughs> the record label rejected that. And the only reason it came out, the record label didn't want to do it, but it was like a compromise. It was a bargaining. She said, "You can do the greatest hits if I can do right. the greatest misses." Yeah. I don't know much about Joni Mitchell. She's she's an incredible artist. I mean, uh, you know, she's she had a really nice moment a few weeks ago at the Grammys. Uh, she performed for the first time. She's 80 years old. Uh, she sang a song. Not for the first time. Yeah, for, for the first time ever. How's she ever? <laughs> yeah, she's never. She's won, I think, 10 Grammys, but she's never performed at the Grammys. Oh, at the Grammys. Yeah. Sorry, you said she performed for the first time. <laughs> oh, I think I said where she performed for no, the first time. No, right, right, okay. Um, okay. Regardless, um, <laughs> she's 80 and she sits, you know, in a chair. She sings this beautiful song. She wins a Grammy for best folk album for a live album uh, that she did which is a bit annoying i think for the other folk artists i would say <laughs> um oh, okay ooh, controversial okay <laughs> uh and uh yeah and yeah she's she's someone who was a part of the whole scene with dylan bob dylan and mm. and leonard cohen and all that for listeners that don't know her you won't find much of her stuff on spotify she's one of those artists where you probably have to go to youtube or uh, she took it off because of Joe Rogan, right? Did she? Yeah. Really? I think, I think yeah. Joe Rogan was uh, Spotify. Yeah, exclusive. Exclusive, right? And he was saying some things that people didn't agree with. I've got to say, I'm a big fan of Spotify as I am with Apple and all so, podcast providers. I'm so glad that the <laughs> end to that sentence yeah. wasn't Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I'm a big fan. Yeah, but a load of people took their stuff off Spotify because of that. And she yeah. was one oh. of them. I mean, it, do we know it wasn't because of us? Because we are on Spotify. Yeah, but we're not an exclusive Spotify. Maybe it was Parenting Hell with Josh Wickham that she made it. <laughs> Wow. But yeah, okay. she's amazing. She's pretty um, cool. She had polio when she was nine years old. Yeah. Um, and interesting thing about that is I was reading about other people who had polio around the time. Mia Farrow had polio when she was nine. Really? Uh, and she wrote that she was taken to an isolation unit because it's catching polio, obviously. Yeah. And she was taken away from all of her family for months and all of her belongings were burned. Is this uh, Mia, Mia Farrow? Farrow yeah. Right. Blimey. Isn't that amazing? Like you That's basically so... at nine years old, you got this disease, they take you away and they burn everything that you own. And is that is that the case with polio that if your toy had if you touch your toy, you could get it from that? Or was it, that a we can... weren't sure what it was? Well, no, it can. It can go through um bodily fluids and stuff like that. Obviously we have vaccines for it now. Joe Rogan told me to say that they go <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we have vaccines for it now, so it's not as much of a problem, right, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it can go through feces, Gosh, through spit, through wow. spit. The speed with which we went from Joni Mitchell to feces. Damn! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's our pipeline, I'm afraid. That's how we roll. It comes yeah. through our pipeline, yeah. yeah. Um, no, Ian Dury of Ian Dury and the Blockheads had polio as a, as a child. Did he? Yeah, yeah, right. so a lot of musicians. Uh, yeah. Yeah, how interesting! It Supposedly was. gave her an edge to how she tuned her guitar at her polio because Who's yeah. Joni? Yeah, Joni yeah. So she got into guitaring a bit about fifteen years old at school, and um, mm-hmm. she was recovering from polio, and it just meant that it must have been harder to tune a guitar for her. Yeah, so she... it kind of changes the way that your bone structure works and stuff like that. There was a footballer called Gorincha who had polio as a child, and it made his legs bandy. But it meant that he kind of ran in a way that no one else ran, and it kind of helped him to play football, supposedly. Huh. Right. She um she started smoking at the age of nine, and she started singing because she wanted to get smoking money. Um, so oh. she was in a cafe in Calgary in Canada, and she was the resident artist. And she was drawing people, and there were pictures would go up on the walls. And then she needed a bit more money, so she started singing. And everyone said, "You're a pretty good singer." And so she went home and asked her mum if her mum would buy her a ukulele. And her mum said, who do you think you are, Kitty Wells? A good one. <laughs> Which I think it was a different time. At the time, that Wells. was probably a really sick burn. <laughs> Kitty Wells, she was the first female country singer to get to the top of the US charts. With her song, It Wasn't God Who Made Honky Tonk Angels. Hmm. That no, this is the kind of song I'd like to listen to, actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, hang on, was it that she started singing at the age of nine, and then people thought, you know what would make this nine-year-old's voice even better? 20 Benson and Hedges a day. <laughs> and then she got into it that way. Uh, no, it wasn't that. No. Okay, okay. Um, she started record... smoking at the age of nine. Oh, and then okay. at the age of like 14 or 15, she was like, I need money for cigarettes. 
So uh, let me write a masterpiece. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Calgary, Alberta, Canada. That's where Bret the Hitman Hart is from, as you would know uh, if you yeah, had the WWE wrestling uh, game. Oh, you would also know that if you spent any time with Dan over the last 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> uh, and then she started dating David Crosby from Crosby, Stills yeah. and Nash. Oh. Uh, and Crosby sort of invited Eric Clapton over to kind of check out this Joni Mitchell. And he said that Clapton sat mesmerized by her playing and her different tunings of her guitar. Although he also said that it might have been slightly due to the fact of all the weed that he'd smoked at the time. <laughs> Afterwards he said, I mean, she's no Kitty Wells. <laughs> <laughs> she is, I mean, to watch footage of her in that period is spectacular. Her music is extraordinary. The songwriting is incredible. And Blue is just it's consistently voted as one of the greatest that? albums. That's, album. yeah, yeah, it's one of her albums, which is always, you know, very near the top of greatest mm. albums of all time. If yeah. you're a millennial, you know Joni Mitchell uh, from... The heartbreaking scene in the film Love Actually, where Emma Thompson receives a gift from her husband, Alan Rickman, and she thinks it's a necklace, but it's really just a Joni Mitchell CD. And oh, then she's yes. Playing it. Yes. And are you saying that actually that's quite a good present to give because she's an incredible yeah, chanteuse? Better than a necklace. Yeah. If uh, but then gonna... it turns out he gave the necklace to his mistress. That's the thing. But if you're oh. going to find out that your husband's taken on a mistress... That's a good present to receive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Moment, Joni Mitchell is great soundtrack yeah. for right, Heartbreak. Right. <laughs> and did they split up because of that moment? I don't film. remember. I they don't think don't. they don't. No, she ta he, no. Ta he, ta he, takes, he, he takes her back. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> he very generously <laughs> <laughs> takes her back. She takes him back. She says, oh, he's just been a bit silly. And, you know, it's all fine. She doesn't um, quite do really. it like that. But yeah. Well, it's not far off. <laughs> um, Joni Mitchell split up with David Crosby by singing him a song at a party. Oh, really? Uh, oh, so oh that's brutal. He has been cheating on her. And she wrote this song, which based, I don't, I haven't heard the song, but right. I imagine in the middle it goes, you're fucking dumps, mate. Yeah. Or whatever. But she played it once and then he was like oh that's really good and she went ah, and played it again because he didn't get it <laughs> oh. <laughs> and was it is it do you know do we know what it's called do we have lyrics uh, it's is... called the song about the midway but I, I haven't seen the lyrics i would have no. called it something like nick is on the back seat or something <laughs> yeah. something that really you know makes him worried even as you're starting to hear the song yeah. oh i you know? see when yeah, you yeah. overdo it on the metaphor so much people can't quite <laughs> the midway sorry uh, uh... Is, that, is that the river that goes through Gillingham that you're talking about you're talking about the battle of medway <laughs> <laughs> um people who've never done a greatest hits album okay acdc you know the reason why because they're all greatest hits albums yeah yeah, uh, yeah. thank you yes, Here right. is, my is that what they said or are you saying that <laughs> I think we agree. I, I and, and ACDC agree on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think a lot of artists fear the, the slight kind of creative death of, yeah. you know, here are your best songs and yeah. that's it. Um, well, yeah. But you can just do another. You know, Aaron Carter, his most requested hit. Which is what? Aaron Carter. Aaron, Car Aaron, Car Aaron Carter. Aaron Carter. Sorry. Aaron Carter. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like the American Backstreet Boys. He, he was the type. younger brother. brother. He passed away oh. very sadly uh, not too long ago. Did he? Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. But his, because most, I was looking up huge lists of greatest hits albums. You know, yeah. it's a lot, long list. And they're almost all called greatest hits, which I think is quite You dull. were looking at this list and then you stopped at AA run. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything about ZZ Top? <laughs> 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 That's why you keep coming up with crime things, Olga. It's like I've been busted by the alphabet, the English alphabet. Uh, uh, I'm gutted. But his uh, was called Most Requested Hits, which I think is a nice slight twist on the formula. Mm, and yeah. then the second one is called Come Get It, the very best of Aaron Carter. Okay. It must be one of his songs or something. Followed uh, yeah. by Too Good To Be True. So I just think he's oh, so good. Oh, they're all for... greatest hits. Every single one of them. Uh, he's got technical. three albums of greatest hits. So I think okay. that is. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. According to Reddit, and it does seem to be true when I checked it, <laughs> yeah. Kiss have had more greatest hit compilations than they have studio albums. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's very good. <laughs> they've That's had great. 20 studio albums. And as far as I can see, they've either had 21 or I counted 23 greatest hits oh, albums. Wow. They did um, a farewell tour in 2000 and 2001. And since then, they've done 13 tours. Hell yeah. Isn't yeah. that amazing? Do you know the biggest selling album in America of all time is um, the greatest hits? I'm going to guess... Ooh. Abba Gold. Well, that's because you've only got to A, B in the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's happened again. Uh, it's the Eagles, isn't it? That's correct. Oh. Yeah. It's the Eagles. Now, so this is their greatest hits album. Um, who here can name a song by the Eagles? Hello, California. Hello, California. That's not on the greatest hits <laughs> no! album. No! Yeah. Isn't that incredible? This is from a period where they hadn't yet <laughs> written that song. They that's must have amazing. felt like chubs. 
coming yeah. up with that song after they've done it. We've already done a greatest hits album. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, man. So this is now not te- oh, canon. This is not a greatest hit. And honestly, I've listened to a few Eagles albums. It's their greatest hit. <laughs> <laughs> the best selling album in the UK is oh, yeah. greatest hits. Oh, Queen. Queen, you got it. At the same time, they released greatest flicks. Uh, which was a video of all their oh, best songs. Very cool. And greatest picks, which was photographs. From that <laughs> That's time. really right. clever. Oh, <laughs> so, who who here owns Queen's greatest hits? Yeah, I've yeah. got my hand up. Oh okay, my god, so two on, of us on cassettes Dan, and then CD and then yeah. So I own it and Dan owns it, and that is it makes sense because one in four British households owns Queen's greatest hits. Really, wow. it's still really. I think probably still there probably is some generational churn happening, but. In 2021, Abba Gold, which is the other huge Greatest Hits album yeah. Um, yeah. after Queens, it got to 1,000 weeks in the top 100 chart. That's, That's amazing. 1,000 weeks. A, it's a perfect, perfect album. Yeah. Perfect band. Well, it's no um, Highway to Hell, but it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, AA... A, B, yeah. and then A, C, D, C. <laughs> Anything about Adam and the Ants? <laughs> there was an album that was released in 1977 by the BBC called Death and Horror. Basically, you know um, how you can just buy incidental sounds, right? Mm. You know, oh, yeah. sorry, like sorry. door creaking. Yeah, door thing. creaking. Yeah. Sorry, the BBC would have like an archive of incidental sounds. So this was all sounds of horrific things. Tracks included Head Chopped Off. Um, assorted creepy creaks, um, red hot poker in the eye. That oh. was it, and it was a top one hundred charting album. Goths went crazy. For it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, team goths. And then this is this is the one I'd love to get, but I don't think it necessarily would have charted. But there was an album called Recorded Delivery by a guy called Yannick Schaefer. So basically, what he did was he put a dictaphone inside a package and he put it through the Royal Mail, and he recorded the entire journey that this dictaphone went on. As wow. it was traveling through the parcel, going through the mailbox, being picked up, put in the van. <laughs> and so what you hear is whistling postmen just sort of walking along. You get sliding van doors. There's lots of clunks. You get early morning mail workers talking about their dirty sex lives. There's a sudden unexpected shout of anus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> and 500 of them were um, were printed. Uh, Brian Eno said he wished he thought of it first. It was a. Uh, uh, it's yeah. very Eno, isn't it? It is very, very Eno. Yeah. The first greatest hits album ever. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Johnny Mathis. Johnny uh, Mathis. In fact, if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, it's the first use of the phrase greatest hits. Right. Did he write a sing a song called Chances Are, which was in Mad Men? Well, chances are he did, if you hey. remember it. Yeah, he was a, he, he was late fifties, wasn't he? So yeah, it's perfect yeah, yeah. timing yes, for Mad Men. Yes, he was. I looked him up. He's still go. alive, Johnny Mathis. Yeah, he's sort of mid nineties, I think. Cool. He's old, but he's he's still kicking around. Still yeah, there. he was a high jumper for the U.S. Olympic team um, before he became a singer. But he was kind of singing in the clubs and stuff. And the head of popular music at Columbia was on holiday in San Francisco and heard him singing and sent a telegram to the company saying, have found phenomenal 19-year-old boy who could go all the way, send blank contracts. Hmm. Oh, that's yeah, great. Like, and oh, he was an Olympian at that time, at 19? Uh, he or... tr- he'd been trying out. Right. He kind yeah. of he got the call to go to the trials. This is a cool thing. In 1956, he got the call to go to the Olympic trials, but he had just got his recording contract. He said to his dad, should I become a high jumper or should I become a musician? It's annoying, isn't it, when people are re- like, world class at... Not one thing, but you two. You could do both it's Vanilla so- Ice as a rapper and a real estate agent. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could do both. <laughs> well, Cody Simpson, the Australian um, ac- singer-actor, also swam for their Olympic team. Oh, yeah. Very nice. And also, is it Gina Davis who almost qualified for archery for Oh, the that's US? right. Yeah. Get away. There you go. You could do both. Yeah. Okay, you could do both. And it's fine that I've done neither. Um, <laughs> Johnny Mathis. It wasn't actually some, any greatest hits. It was just something they rushed out because he was about to go on tour in the UK. He didn't have time to record any new tracks, so they just bundled together his first four recordings. Oh, is that right? Called them Johnny's Greatest Hits. Huh. It was in the charts for nine years. <laughs> um, so they manifested it. Pretty much. They're like, yeah. the greatest hit, Australian inflection. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <it's exactly that. laughs> um, and there's a reason why you'd love him, James. He used to play golf 300 times a year. Oh, he sounds great. <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> and he has a cookbook library. He loves cookbooks so much. He bought thousands of them. He mm. had off his kitchen his own oh. library of cookbooks. And he, in 1982, he wrote his own cookbook 
called Cooking for You Alone, which is all about meals for one and how you can make them <gasps> delicious and lovely. Oh. Oh. Isn't that? Oh. He's, I just think he seems like a really nice, sweet guy. That's so sweet. That I know. Sweet. That does sound nice, but if you think that you're going to get a necklace for Valentine's Day <laughs> yeah. and you get the <laughs> meals for one book, <laughs> that's yeah. a real that's sign. How, that's how Joni Mitchell dubbed her next boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our various social media accounts. I'm on Instagram using the name Schreiberland. Andy? I'm at Andrew Hunter M on Twitter. James? Uh, my Twitter is at James Harkin. Yep. And Olga? I'm at Colga300 on Instagram. Nice. And also do make sure to go and see Olga live. Prawn Cocktail, you're on tour Prawn right Cocktail now. is the name of my show. You'll just be eating it nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise it's going to be 100% high quality prawns and never a cheap meatball. <laughs> uh, yeah, or if you want to get in contact with us as a group, by the way, you can go to at no such thing on Twitter. You can email us on podcast at qi.com or you can just go to our website, no such thing as a fish, if you want to check out all the previous episodes because they're all up there. So do that. Otherwise, just come back next week. We'll be back with another episode and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Anus. You, you <laughs> 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 Lovely Easter egg. Uh. Uh.